to the book of Philippians, you know to go there. Philippians chapter 2. And uh, we're looking at a message that we started last week together regarding the topic, the title, what's really come out of what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 2, and that is faith on fire. Philippians chapter 2. We're talking about what happens when a Christian is on fire for the Word of God by the Holy Spirit in his culture. And Paul is speaking to the Philippian believers declared by the emperor of Rome to be a Roman province, which was a high honor in that region of Macedonia. They were given all full rights and citizenship as Romans, as though they were born in the empire, but they were a city that, and a culture that Rome loved. It was pagan, it was, it was Romanesque to say the least, paganism and all of its practices, and of course the preeminent worship was the worship of emperor worship, the worship of the Roman Empire, and that personified in the emperor of Rome. But a church was born out of the preaching of the Apostle Paul in passing through the region. He preaches the gospel. Believers come to respond, and a church is not only established, but it's a good church. It's a healthy church. It has, like all churches, its challenges. And as we get deeper into the book, we'll come to some of those challenges. But one of them we saw in verse 14. And again, part two, faith on fire, verses 14 through 18. Paul says to them, do all things without complaining and disputing. And you should have that marked in your Bible now if you were here last week. It's a serious thing. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom, that is those who are crooked and perverse, you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Verse 17, yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Faith on fire. So what does a Christian look like? We studied last time When a Christian is on fire in the culture and, well, I'll tell you the difference, I'll tell you what that means, it's not only that we're taking the word of God serious, but here's what happens to all of us who decide today, perhaps, to just absolutely wake up to the realization that you and I live in a crooked and perverse generation. I mean, church, open your eyes, look around with, with no despair, but rather look around and get excited. You hear the bad news coming out of the culture, but listen, that is a call to the believer to get involved. That's a call for the believer to shine the light, as we're hearing today. So what does it look like when a Christian is on fire? I'll tell you, a Christian that's on fire is a Christian that is, as it were, an implement or a tool now in the hand of God. Lord, here I am. That's what Paul is saying to them. Really bring yourselves to the usefulness of God. Lord, allow me to be an implement of your work. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, so you ask yourself personally, are you called by his name? Whom I have created for my glory, that's why you're living right now, friend. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. God has made us for his glory. That's where we begin. That's... The argument is, why are you alive? Why am I alive today? Well, that that we might shine for the glory of God. God has created us for his glory, but what does that mean? What does that look like? And by the way, can I say this? Um, Today, being a Christian, and I hope this kind of gets under the skin of some of you that it needs to get under, if you are in fact here today, to be a Christian is to not to sit idle or to be uh, useless in the kingdom of God. God is... God hasn't saved you just to have you in heaven forever. He has saved you to use you now. What matters now, you know, somebody has appropriately said that the life lived is at your tombstone, the life lived is the dash that's between the two dates. Your birth date dash the day that you died. Isn't that kind of sad? You go to a graveyard, you see a tombstone, and you look at a life that was lived, and it was lived on the dash. It's not the dates that mattered, it's what happened between those two dates. 
That's your life. And as a Christian, we're called to give glory to God. But what does that look like? Well, I tell you what, it it means more than us existing. It means more, listen, than us just paying the bills. It means more than us than just hammering out an existence. It's way beyond that. All of those things are to facilitate what you and I are to be as Christians in this world. And it's not until Jesus Christ is central in your life that your life has real meaning and purpose. I want to remind you again, I showed it to you some years ago, but it's the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's number one. And uh, I think it's a great statement. What's your purpose in living? Take a look at this. The question is asked, what is the chief end of man? Great question. What's the chief end of man? The statement of chief end, what's the reason for his existence? The answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Is that too simple? I don't think so. It's beautiful. God is saying, I created you for my glory and for your enjoyment. Translation, you will never have a fulfilled life, powerful and useful to God, until you come to that place of enjoying him. And when you enjoy him, when you open up the Bible and find out who he is, then in that experience, you give glory to God in walking with him. And that is the meaning of life as God intended. What does it look like? Psalm 100. Psalm 100, verse 1, Bible students, put this down. This is a glorious psalm. Psalm 100, beginning at verse 1, listen to this. This is God's will for your life. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. Hey, can you shout on the count of three? One, two, three. That was a little weak, but the Lord loves it. Still, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Is this not happy stuff? Isn't this beautiful stuff? This is God speaking to you. This is what he wants of you. You come to me singing. You come to me shouting. Joyful. Verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Wow. And into his courts with praise. By the way, praise is, uh, there's worship and then there's praise. They both bless God, but they're two different aspects of giving him glory. There's worship and there's praise. Praise is predominantly loud and uh, and, uh, full of of cheer and joy. Worship can be, you can actually be sitting on a rock or a a log, uh, weeping as it were, but yet still worshiping God. The full spectrum. But he goes on. Be thankful to him, bless his name, verse 5, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Listen, we were created for a purpose, and that is to give God glory, and God wants to burn through your life. And that's what Paul is speaking to the church at Philippi. He warns them, no doubt, about some things that keep them derailed from that, but we're to burn, we're to be on fire. And none of us, by the way, the Bible says that we're never wise when we judge ourselves among ourselves. Did you know that? When you, when you think of a Christian, you, me, us, being on fire for God, don't think that you're supposed to be like somebody else. If God wanted you to be like somebody else, you would be like somebody else. You are not to be like someone else. You're to be like you. Well, what does that look like? Well, we don't know. We're waiting to see. But when we catch fire for God, he will use who you are and what you are to add to the complexion of the body of Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Faith on fire cannot be denied. It can only be neglected, but it cannot be denied. It can be pushed away, but it cannot be denied. And I thought about faith on fire for a moment as we get into this introduction. I thought of Abraham's faith. Would you say Abraham's faith was on fire? I would. What about King David? Faith on fire? Absolutely. Isaiah, faith on fire. Paul the Apostle, obviously. But I read this week about a man whose faith was on fire. And I read this. Quote, a well-known Scottish philosopher and historian of the 18th century, David Hume, a self-proclaimed deist, confessed 
to not believing in supernatural inspiration, nor divine revelation, nor Jesus Christ being the Son of God, nor the Bible. Yet he made himself to be an eyewitness to more than one of George Whitfield's evangelistic outreaches. Hume, it has been reported, traveled some 20 miles on horseback just to hear Whitfield preach at one of his outdoor gatherings or his open air preaching uh, gatherings. There is an account that at about five o'clock in the morning, as David Hume was going down a street in London, he came around a corner and fell straightway into the hands of a man heading in the opposite direction. I guess that means they bumped into each other. Who, recognizing Hume, said, Why aren't you David Hume? Yes, Hume replied. And where are you going at this early hour of the morning? I'm going to hear Mr. George Whitfield preach, replied Hume. But you don't believe a word Whitfield preaches, said the man. No, said Hume, but George Whitfield does. Think of it for a moment. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the deity of Christ. I don't believe in the Bible, Hume said. But to get him up and out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning to go hear Whitfield preach in the open air, why was he going? What drew this soul to hear the preaching of the gospel was the fact that George Whitfield believed in what he was preaching. Christian, do you believe in what you claim to believe? Do you really believe it? Do you believe it enough to preach it and live it to the culture that you're in? That would make you a Christian on fire, making a difference, vitally important. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. This is all introduction. We have a huge introduction today. <laughs> Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, and the place that they were assembled together was shaken, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Awesome. And I love the fact that when you read the New Testament accounts of who our forefathers were in the faith, you think of Peter or Paul. Well, you think of Mary, Peter, Paul, and Mary. You think of James and Jude and all of them. They were, they were people just like us. But they determined, warts and all, faults and all, to follow God. For you and I to determine today, I'm going to follow God no matter what. I've looked at the Bible. I've looked at the culture. Who and what am I living for? And so Paul gave them a warning. We saw that last time. He warned them. Do all things without complaining and disputing. And I deliberately want to go back just a moment because we spent so much time there last week, but I just feel like not enough. The Bible warns us as Christians today. Write this down, please. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Paul is telling the church at Philippi, he's telling the church at Chino Hills, do everything as believers like Jesus. Stop complaining and stop disputing with each other that leads to nothing but division. Stop spending time on non-essentials. You're being distracted. And whenever we get into that vortex, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, the word quench here is, in a, is a very powerful and picturesque word. It paints a picture, and it means to snuff out a flame. It means to exhaust or to extinguish a flame. It means that we're to avoid offending the Holy Spirit. There's so much talk today about people being offended. Frankly, I don't care. If you're living and breathing, let's grow up right now, okay? If you're living and breathing, you're going to be offended. Just grow up. Deal with it. You're tougher than that, Okay? You're going to be offended. I was offended last night at how slow the traffic was on the freeway. That offended me. Somebody might have been offended that it was going too fast. Offenses come. Jesus says they come. But woe unto the person who brings offense. So watch out. Don't be the offender, but we're all going to be offended in life. Not everyone's living out or going to live to protect our feelings. Have you discovered that? But we are not to be accomplices of quenching the Holy Spirit. Church, this church, start thinking about what the Holy Spirit thinks, feels, and what he experiences in our lives. Don't quench him. Do not exhaust the flame of the Holy Spirit. Don't do something that causes him to recoil, is what the word means. In Luke chapter 6, verse 41, Luke 6, 
41, Jesus says, why do you look, the word is stare, why do you stare at the speck, the piece of dust, the word here is uh, dust that comes from straw, just minute particle. Why do you stare at the minute particle that's in your brother's eye, but you do not perceive the plank, the limb, the branch in your own eye? Isn't that colorful speech of Jesus? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye, hypocrites? (laughs) First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clear enough to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Fault finders. Sin sniffers. Hey, I see this in your life. Wait a minute. Thank you very much. But before we go around and play the role of the Holy Spirit, we better take a look at our own lives, right? And I tell you, if you do that, you will not complain or dispute anymore. Listen, I'm going to say this. Catch it. It's going to sound like a bizarre contradiction. Don't miss it. But as you grow closer to Jesus as a Christian, you will see yourself less holy and less worthy and less glorious as when you first started your Christian walk. Did you guys all hear that? He said, oh, pastor, I want to grow close to Jesus. Okay, you know, then strap on your helmet and put your mouthpiece in because here's what's going to happen. As you get closer to the glorious and beautiful light of Jesus, you're going to look more scummy and more disgusted and more ridiculous and more sinful to yourself. You won't have time to point at other people. Your fingers will be pointing back at you. And you say, really? I thought if I got closer to Jesus, I would kind of walk on water too. No, the opposite. You'll see how horrific you are. You'll agree with Paul who says, I'm the chief of sinners. Everybody else would have said, Paul, I want to be just like Paul. This is the strange contradiction of Christianity. The closer we get to Jesus, more people want to be like us. The closer we get to Jesus, we don't want to be like us. Did you get that? I just made that up. I think that's profound. Let me think about it for a minute. It's true. (laughs) Think of the people who are making an impact in your life. You say to yourself, I want to be like them when I grow up spiritually. But if you talk to them, they say, you know what? I'm nothing but a bucket of bolts. I'm a mess. And it kind of messes you up. You kind of get disillusioned, don't you? You're like, wait, what? It's amazing. We're not to quench the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, watch out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, this is the reason. Ephesians 4, 25, therefore put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. In other words, you're going to have a temper, you're going to have anger. Some people say this is to be angry at sin, of course, but this word clearly means that if you get angry, don't let the sun, read it, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. It means if you get angry, you better settle the account with your friend. Husband and wife, you better make up before you go to bed. Oh, what if we have to stay up all night? Then stay up all night. Better to make up and go to bed. Don't let the sun go down, go down on your wrath. Why? Nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor and work with his own hands for what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And here it is. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Listen. Listen by whom you were what? Sealed for or unto the day of redemption. The word sealed here is an awesome word. In fact, I'm going to show you a stamp on the screens that exhibit this. The word sealed here in the Greek language is awesome. It means to stamp or to emboss into that which is soft. It's to take something of authority, something of a decree, something of ownership that is unchangeable, and to press it into that which takes on the mold. It means that this embossing or stamping, the soft material takes on that which is unchanging. So you see a picture of a seal, stamp. Why is this important? The Bible says that you as a believer have been stamped, sealed with the Holy Spirit. By the way, listen, I'm not going to debate with any of you, rather, over these issues of can you 
uh, lose your salvation, once saved, always saved, all this kind of junk. Let me tell you something right now. The Bible makes it extremely clear. If you are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be unsealed. It simply says that you can grieve the Holy Spirit, which is sad enough, but you're sealed. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ today? Do you trust Christ having died on the cross for your sins and been resurrected from the dead? Have you invited him to come into your life to forgive you of your sins? You've been stamped by the Holy Spirit. Proof of it is you can't sin good anymore. You can have a thought that used to entertain and now you can't. He won't let you. He'll convict you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has sealed you into the day of redemption. It's his job, look, to deliver the letter, that's you, to the Lord, sealed by the Holy Spirit. You've been sealed. So act like it. Live like it. Enjoy that fact and be empowered by it. Christ will never leave you or forsake you. Makes all the difference in the world. The object is marked out by the authority. And the reason is to serve him. We're almost at the study point here of this message. <laughs> One final thing. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans 8, 29. Listen up. Regarding all of us who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. For whom he foreknew. Circle the word foreknew. That means God's eternal. He can't learn anything. He knows everything. He knew that on Monday night, June 20th, 1977, at about 8.45 in the evening, I would accept him as my Lord and Savior. He knew that in his foreknowledge. He also predestined. That is, for what purpose? Well, he predestined me, us, to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus stamped, sealed in us. That he might be the firstborn or preeminent one among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also, what's the word? Glorified. Glorified. That's your life. So church, last time in verses 14 and 15, we saw that faith on fire is a faith that cannot be hidden. Why? Because it's a faith that burns. It's a faith that is consumed. That is Jesus. The more Jesus is burning in our lives, the less of us show up. The less of us is at the helm. The more of Christ, we are consumed with him as being the Lord of our lives, not just Savior, but Lord. So we saw faith that is burning faith, we saw faith that is consumed, and we saw faith that is seen, a faith that is absolutely physical, visible. So church, here we go. Number two is in verse 16. Faith on fire, it's a faith that cannot be extinguished. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Your faith as a believer cannot be extinguished. Hear me out. Even in this service, before this service began, I saw some of you who have been living through the fiery trials of loss, profound financial loss, business deals having gone bad, you've lost everything. I saw some of you this morning who are still, and it's not over, you're still grieving the loss of your husband or your wife. Fiery trials. Difficulties that take your faith to the wall. Families that are struggling. Families that are asking God why. Our faith is there Dependent upon how much you've invested in your faith by consuming the Bible, more Bible, more Bible builds a stronger faith. But listen... Faith strong, faith weak. Your faith in Jesus Christ emotionally will have its ups and downs. It will have its high points and its low points emotionally. It's best to get away from the dictate of emotion. It will rip us off every time. We've got to bring all that we experience under the truth of God's word, the very questions that rise up in your mind, if God loved me, then why did this just happen? Go to what you know the Bible says. 
We had such a perfect marriage and now my wife is gone. Or my husband has passed and we were the most amazing couple. What happened? Listen, nothing happened. Listen, this world, we're not home yet. This, not, this is not heaven. Listen, life comes and life goes. Some people die in the womb. Some people die at 100. If the Bible didn't address this, then I could say to you, we have no hope. But the Bible addresses these things in detail. Thus, we have all hope. Yes, our emotions are in a whirlwind, but God's word is firm. It's sure. Your faith cannot be extinguished. God, the Holy Spirit, will see to it. Oh, pastor, listen. I encounter people so often. Oh, pastor... In fact, Wednesday night, I'm just reminded just now. Oh, pastor, this didn't go right. This other thing didn't go right. I've come to this conclusion. And this guy told me, he said he picked up his Bible and he took it and he dropped it off like he was dropping off like a runaway, you know, like an unwanted puppy or kitten. He took his Bible and dropped it off somewhere and got got away from it, took off and left it. Like it wasn't going to follow him down the street. You know what happened? His Bible, as it were, in his conscience just ran down the street behind his car. He said, that's it, God, I'm done with you. You didn't do what I thought you would do. I'm done with you. And he just kind of, as it were, drove away from the word. He dropped off the word like, a, like an unwanted puppy and took off. And you know what he told me? He said, in my mind, all I, I couldn't, I, even though I was pointing in one direction, my mind, my eyes, my heart, my soul was looking back. And I smiled. And I said, you know why? I said, because you're a believer. Oh, God, I can't take it anymore. Listen, God God can handle your lapse in faith. He's way tough. The thing is, you can't. You can try to run. You can try to cave in. It's not going to happen. The Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, it would just be miserable for you. He will draw you back. He will pull you back. He calls us. Look at verse 16. Because of him who calls us, holding fast the word of life. The word holding here, mark it down, powerful word. The word holding in the Greek language is very vivid. It not only means to hold in your possession. Are you listening? Anybody listening? It, It means to hold in your possession, but watch. The word means to lift it up and to lift it out. To hold it means you are a possessor of the word of life the gospel, you hold it up for others to see, this is for every believer, and you hold it out that others might take of it. That's what the word means. That's powerful, isn't it? This is our lives. You say, Jack, you mean that's for you, right? You're in the ministry. That's what we pay you to do. Isn't that what you do? Listen, this is what I've always done. I got saved. I got excited. You got saved. You got excited. The calling upon my life is different than the calling that's upon your life. I cannot fulfill your call. You cannot fulfill my call. We're all called. We're called to go to the world that God has sent us to. Are you a school teacher? God bless you and God help you. No, seriously. They're on the front lines of faith under fire today. Wow. I don't know if I could do that. To be a God-honoring Christian in the public school system. I so respect you. I'm so thankful for you and to you. Holding fast the word of life. Remember, that we learned last time the setting is in a dark world. Holding fast the word of life. Holding out the torch of the word of life. 2 Corinthians, listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. I love this verse. When personally, when I'm doing street evangelism, um, this is one of my favorite verses. Why? Because, and we, I remember um, a group of young men in Russia, we were doing street outreaches, and they were making fun, and they're goofing off, and they had their uh, whiskey or their vodka, and they're mocking us and stuff, and we watched, as the word went out, we watched them get convicted. You could just see it on their face. They're like, oh, and they're giving us gestures, and, and, um, and then they just start going like this. Now watch me. They start, and they got their bottle here. And they're like, that's how they, no. And then they're like this. Right? 
we were in this one outreach and I was given the gospel and this one guy shouted out a profanity in English so we could all hear it. And he gave me a gesture right in front of everybody. And there was a, there was a bouncer there. We were actually doing, given the gospel, we rented a bar in St. Petersburg, Russia. I'm not kidding. We rented a bar and we took it over. And there's a bunch of drunks in there. And you give, listen, the whole, because the team held the word of God, we had it here, we just obeyed the word. It was not us, obviously. It's the Holy Spirit. We put up the word and we put out the word. What happened? What happened? People got saved. I mean, people got saved. Some of them we still know today. And this was so many years ago. This particular thing I'm thinking about was in 2006. People got saved. What happened? The word was held. Because the word was held, it was held up and it was presented outward. And this verse is so powerful. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, here it comes. In an acceptable time, I've heard you. This is the word to the non-believer, inviting them to accept Christ. In an acceptable time, I've heard you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. Paul says now, behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do you sense the urgency there? Now, now come to Christ. I don't like a sense of urgency uh, much at all. If someone's going to push me to do something, I push back automatically. I'm just not into that. Oh, if you don't buy this car today, I got five people coming down here this week that they're going to buy it. Well, then let them have it. This is the last dryer we have here at this price. You got to buy it now or you're going to lose it. No washer and dryer for you. Well, then you know what? Forget it. I don't like that. But listen, this I like because none of us, and if you're not a Christian today, you don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. Oh man, that's just sales pitch. Hey, listen, I'll, uh, with all due respect, I'm going to heaven with or without you. This ain't no pitch. No pitch at all. You want to go to heaven, you need to decide that quick because you don't know if you're going to be alive by sunset tonight. Paul says, now's the acceptable time. Today's the day of salvation. Hold up the word and hold it out. Christ is coming. Your life will end. Do you know him? He's saying that the believer, we work together and we are announcing this to a world. The invitation to all of us is to unite in getting out the word. Paul says we work together. To do this, there's an urgency about it. And look, it's the word of life. Holding fast the word of life. You can write in your margins, the gospel. It is that, 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead. That he's God's son, come to earth for us, the gospel. The urgency, the word of life, what is preached, what is given. Paul's argument suggests this, that the word of life is like a torch Remember the context, church, as you shine as lights in a perverse, godless age. Christians, you're going to get out of this building soon. You're going to go shine with like a torch, the believers to shine. But look, none of us shine when we give our own word. None of us shine when we are preaching our own message. We are to give the gospel. We are to give the word of life. Notice the Bible says of itself, it gives life. Wow. Notice too, the culture pushes back. The dark, perverse culture that he's talking about pushes back from the word. Translation, death, darkness. Embrace the word, light, and life. Let me remind you of a few things. Genesis 1, verse 3. God said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. The word, listen, the word of life, well, God said. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my feet path. Notice what God speaks is the word of life. What God says happens. Matthew 7, 24, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, Jesus said. Isn't it amazing? Hold your finger there for a second. Jesus never said, never said, thus saith the Lord. 
Did Isaiah say, thus saith the Lord? Yep. Did Ezekiel say, thus saith the Lord? They all did. Jesus never did. You want to know why? Because he was the Lord. Jesus said, I say unto you. Isn't that fun? Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to be a wise man who built his house on the rock. John 7, 38. He who believes in me as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The word of life. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's where the power lies. It's God's word given to us. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what do we say about that? What do we do about that as believers? We are to hold forth the word of God. What do we do? The answer is in Colossians 3. Jot it down if you would, Bible student, Colossians 3.10. Here's what we do as Christians today. We take the word of God, the word of life, and we put it on. He says, put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Every Christian around the globe, no matter their station or status, we are one in Christ. Verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. This is, this is not an option. This is what we're to do. We have to yield ourselves to be that implement. Lord, make me a tool. God says to us, all right, then you're going to walk with me. Here's what you do. Put on tender mercies. I practice that. I'm to do that. I fail at it miserably. But this is, this is our response. We put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing, putting up with, caring with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Wow. To which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Church, family, if we commit Colossians 3, 10 to 16 to our doing, I don't know what to say. If all of us say today, this is what I'm going to put on. Imagine, we've got enough homework in Colossians 3, 10 to 16 for the rest of the year right there. We will do this. If we write the verse down, we copy it, we paste it up everywhere we go, and we, we start saying, I'm going to do this. Do you realize that if we do that, we're going to have to just start with, put on the new man. That's where I'd have to start. God, I'd have to say, Lord, what does that look like? What does that mean? Who am I as this new man? You want to talk about discipleship? You don't need to buy another book. You don't need to go to a class. You don't need a course. Do that. Put on the new man. Sit down and ask God, what does that look like in your life? Become a new man. Become a new woman. Become a new husband, a new wife, a new mom, a new dad, a new kid. How do you do that? Lord, work these things into my life. He calls us to this. There's no option. He calls us to these things. Number two, look at verse 16. It's because of him who keeps us. He not only calls us, whatever God does in the calling, built into that calling is the keeping. Holding fast the word of life, so. Circle the word so, it's awesome. A little word. So that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Paul is saying this, hold forth the word of life. And here's the reason why. The so is the prerequisite to his statement that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Paul is saying, I want you guys to grow so strong spiritually so I can be happy in the day of Christ. This is an awesome brother. This man has a wonderful heart for the people. Paul is saying, I'll do anything. I will be like a drink offering poured out on the altar. I'll, do, I'll, I'll go to my death if you become a stronger, better, healthier believer. And why, Paul says, if you guys do well, he's saying... I'm going to be so happy in the day that we stand before the Lord. What a guy. Is this not the opposite of what we see so much today and what it's called Christian ministry? 
It's the exact opposite. The deification of pastors or evangelists or super Christians. Oh, rock star personalities in Christianity. Really? All about me.com, right? Uh, follow me at my bit of wisdom, my thing. Th- Wait a minute. Paul says, here's my thing. Tweet this. I'll die for the church of Philippi if they'll do better. On the day of Christ, he said, if I'm invisible so that they are doing well on the day of judgment, I'll be happy. That's the true meaning of a minister. To give of yourself for the betterment of others. This is lost today. It's tragic. God keeps us. There's a day coming. We'll all need to remember this as we stand before the Lord. There's a day coming, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Therefore, we make it our aim, our target, our goal, whether present or absent, that is, in this world or in the world to come, to be well-pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what has Uh, What he has done, whether good or bad. Did you know all of us as Christians are going to stand before Jesus, not the Father? You guys, don't confuse this with the great white throne judgment. You're not going there. You're not going to that judgment. That's the judgment of the lost. You and I will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus. This is different. The Bema seat. It's the Olympic reward seat. And he's going to look at our lives and what did we do with our lives? We want to remember that in the day of Christ. We want to be able to stand there. Look, I have to tell you, it's very self-serving. I want you to do really well. So on that day, I can say, Lord, they went to Calvary Chapel. Do you know (laughs) else? When you're standing there and the day that, how you live that dash between the dates of your birth and your death, that dash that was lived, God is going to acknowledge what you did in your earthly body for his glory. And I want to be able to stand in the back. You know, listen, we prayed for little Noah last Wednesday night, and he passed away this week, Uh, and when I got word of that, the first thing that came to my mind, he suffered so much, but yet he was used so mightily by God, and it just dawned on me, little Noah entered into his ark, and I spelled ark capital letters, because Jesus is that place of rest. There's going to be a day when you and I stand before the Lord, and it's not going to be a determination of heaven or hell. It's going to be a determination of how you were used for God. And so listen, can I, can I allow this to sound like some sort of seatbelt, shoulder harness insurance? You know those people, you've seen people like put on those rubber suits and they're going to punch each other and stuff like that? Allow this to be like that. You get to be, please, radical for God. Go, go and be crazy for God because you're safe. You're protected by him. He's going to keep you. You don't have to go like this. Oh, oh, someday I'm going to stand before God and I I don't want to mess anything up, so I'm going to stand right here. That's a lie from our emotions and I'm sure from the devil. We need to be like this. Lord, you saved me. You said so. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm not going to stand around. You gave my life a life to be lived. I want to live it to your glory. So Lord, uh, I'm going to assume this from from the get-go right now. I'm going to go forward, and if I fail, you're going to give me an A for trying. But I'm not going to stand here and get an F uh, just to be still. I'm going to pray. I'm going to step out. I'm going to do. I'm no longer going to be a spectator to this Christian thing. I'm going to do it, Jesus. You saved me, so until you call me home, I'm going to go live it. I'm going to go do it. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And get up and do whatever it is he tells you to do. And let him, not your neighbor, not your friend, not this church, or not somebody else, judge you about what you're doing. You are to answer to God. Is it biblical? Is it Christ honoring? Is it doctrinally sound? Yes, then do it. We need to stop living like we have no safety rails or no seatbelts on. The Holy Spirit has secured us. He keeps us. 
And that's a safe thing. He keeps us. 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, 1 Peter 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope through, what's the guarantee? The living hope? Through the resurrection of Jesus. Question, is Jesus risen from the dead? Then you have a never-ending hope. Period. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, where the state doesn't take it all from you, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are what? Kept by the power of God. Are you a Christian? Raise your hand right now if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian with your hand raised, you are kept by the power of God, not you. Kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, last days. Jude 24. Jude 24. There's only one chapter, so it's verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Is that, that is going to be amazing. You're going to be in his presence. <laughs> wow! I mean, I'm going to be like, well, I made it! And God's going to say, oh, that's fine. Yeah, but hey, listen, now you get excited because this is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you, Jack, when you, you thought I wasn't working in your life, I was working. You know what? Remember when you did this and you just thought you totally flopped? I was in that. I was working. You know what? Remember when you did this or you did that? Or do you remember when this came to you and, and you didn't do it? You stood for rights? You didn't cave in? Yeah. I, I was glorified in that. Listen, we're going to stand before him with exceeding joy. That's going to be a good day. Why? Because we're kept by the power of God. We can be bold because he's the keeper of your soul. Amen. You're invincible until Christ calls you home. Philippians 1.6, you love this. We read this months ago. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing. Listen to his boldness. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, we're almost done. 2 Timothy 1 12. For this reason, Paul says, I suffer these things. He was suffering all kinds of things. Beat up, shipwrecked, tortured. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Wow. For I know whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. It's exact same words. I have given my life to Christ. I'm a bozo. I, f- I fail. But I tell you what, I want to draw closer to God. And the closer I get, the more disgusting I look to me. That's what Paul is saying. And I want to say that. But in the end, Lord, everything I've done, I try to do to glorify you. That's what you want to say, don't you? And we end here with this. Faith on fire is a faith that cannot be extinguished because of him who uses us. I love this. Look, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I've not ministered in vain, served in vain. What does this mean? Number one, look at this. Paul uses language that is lifted right up out of the Greek gymnasium, literally. When he uses the word run or the word labor, these are words that are used in two halls of the Greek world. Watch this. When he says that I've not run in vain or labored in vain, it was words used in the gymnasium. Now, when you and I think gymnasium, in fact, if you're from Germany, in the education system, there's the gymnasium, and it's not with weights, and that's lifted from the Greek. In the ancient Greek world, the gymnasium was a place where athletes worked out, and philosophers and poets and heralds, proclaimers, practice their methods in the same place. The gymnasium. We live in a culture where the gymnasium is, is reduced to physical workout. The Greeks thought it was full body, mind and soul, the gymnasium. And Paul is saying, he's using, he's lifting it right up and he's saying, hey, how about this? I want to make sure that when I come to the end of my life, that when we stand before God, I will have worked out with a great effect. It wasn't fruitless. In other words, by God's grace, a mark was left. 
The word run means to set out on a course. Listen, it means to run with destination in sight. You don't want to start running forest without a destination. If you're running, and you assume when you see someone running, they know where they're going, right? Can you imagine running? Where are you going? I don't know. Wouldn't that be weird? Paul says, I don't want to run without having the target in sight. And he said labor. He uses the word labor. He says, I don't want to work myself to the point of fatigue, blood, sweat, and tears, and it not affect anyone's life. In 1 Corinthians 9.24, the Bible says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. Gold medal, wreath, whatever. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus. Paul's going to tell us how he runs. Not with uncertainty, thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air. <laughs> but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Wow. He runs with purpose, and he doesn't beat the air if he's fighting. Have you ever seen, <laughs> have you ever seen somebody from a distance that's like swatting bees, but they're far enough away where you can't see the bees, and you're looking at them, and you're going, oh gosh, that person's having a stroke or something. <laughs> you know how funny that looks? The person's going, like this? That's the word. It means to flaw, just flail about with your hands in, in boxing with no target. Paul says, I don't be like that. A lot of Christians live their lives like that. You know you're living your life like that when someone says to you, hey, what's the Lord showing you? What's going on in your life? And you go, oh, oh, you don't have anything to say. If a friend or someone should say to you, hey, how you doing? Gosh, you know, it's great to see you. So what's God doing in your life? If you don't have an answer, you know what? You're going to heaven. You're saved. God loves you. But here's the deal. You're running around with no destination. Your arms are moving, but you're not making any progress. If Sunday morning is your only Bible, you're kind of directionless during the whole rest of the week. Paul says, don't be like that. And so we end with this. I'm going to leave you with this picture. Faith on fire. I want you to hear this. Charles Spurgeon talked about a situation. I, I wish I had the quote for you. Charles Spurgeon talked about a situation that happened on the English coast. There was a lighthouse, and the storm was so violent that the lighthouse flame that was burning, you know, those lights, by the way, are not anything profound. It's the lens. Are you aware of that? Have you ever seen a lighthouse? It's not, the magic is not in the power of the flame. It's in the magnification of the lens. And the lighthouse will have like an octagon or pentagon shaped head to it, window to it. And Spurgeon said this man, this uh, lighthouse keeper heard crashing of the glass and he went up to see, listen, he went up to see that the storm, maybe it was a pelican, a bird or something, had broke through and to keep the light burning in light of one panel of the glass being broken, he put up wood, understandably, he put up wood over just one-eighth or one-fifth of the angled glass at the top of the lighthouse. That's all. Just one-fifth. Four-fifths are shining. They found out later the next day that there was a ship crashed on the shore and all perished dead. The lighthouse keeper wasn't aware of it till the day dawned. It turns out that the name of that particular ship was sailing from a certain area back into England. The angle that it was sailing in the storm, it was the very angle where that panel had been replaced with wood. In some directions, the light was shining. 
but not in all directions. And that ship captain must have been looking for the light on his chart. There was no light where there should have been light. And that ship, to the peril of all those merchants on board, perished at sea, striking the rocks. Jesus said, if your eye is dark, Christian, if your eye is darkened by sin, darkened by the things of this world, if you're not shining fully, there's one panel of your life, there's one room, there's one door, there's one window that's darkened by God can speak to you about what that is in your life. This area is dark. Jesus says, he's speaking to the believer. If that one area is dark, oh, how dark is that light. He says a strange thing. Wait a minute, Jesus, what? He says, let your eye be full of light. But if there is darkness in that view, in that eye, how dark great is the darkness of that light. Sounds like a contradiction. Well, you may be shining on Sunday. You may be shining on Wednesday. You may be shining at the office. You may be shining on the sports field. But there's a blocked out window of light in your home. I trust God to speak to each of us of is there, Lord, in my life a panel missing that cannot take a little flame and by the power of the Holy Spirit's magnification be used to a light held up and put forth the world that is perishing. How we need one another more than ever. Are the days dark? Yes. Have they gotten darker since last Sunday? Yes. We must shine, Christians. We must forsake this world and see it for what it is. It is an allurement. It is a world, the Bible says, full of iniquity. And it seeks to destroy us. Judge yourself today. Is there a panel where I'm not shining the light through? And if we do this as a church, personally, it must be personal. I cannot say, oh man, look at you. Boys, you're, you've got a big panel there. No, you've got to discover. Ask God what he is saying. He asked us to shine his light, and I wrote this down to myself. So if it sounds dumb, it clearly was for me only then. As a Christian, and we as Christians are to be lights, I'm thankful to God that he never qualified what the intensity of the light should be. I wrote this down yesterday thinking about, gosh, Lord, my light stinks. But wait a minute, he speaks to my heart. I never qualified, Jack. I never defined the intensity of the light. I just told you to be light. I'm grateful that he didn't say that we all have to be raging fires or voluminous infernos. I can't be a Chuck Smith or a Greg Laurie. I was not supposed to be. Not all of us are called to be torches, but all of us are called to be at least a match. And even the smallest match burning against a dark age is a bright thing. You can close your Bible. You guys know in World War II, did you know that when the Germans were bombing Europe, did you know what you were commanded to do during the night raids of the German Luftwaffe as they came in to bomb London? Did you know that you were forbidden to strike a match at night if you lived in England? Did you know that? That was the law. When the sun went down, they, the entire... England was black because they said, it's reported, don't believe me, it sounds crazy, look it up. They said on a clear night against such absolute blackness that a match could be seen 10 miles away. Do you see just a match against such blackness 10 miles away? Oh, then what happens if a church catches fire? Huh? What happens if the Christian burns? on the campus, or at home. That's the challenge. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that your Holy Spirit 
will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, that you're the one that is to do this thing called Christianity. As we yield, as we surrender, as we surrender, church, listen, can we still pray, but can you stand? We remain in an attitude of prayer. Father, in standing, we are surrendering. In standing, we are saying today, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Lord, we stand today in surrendering because we know that true meaning, existence, and purpose comes from you and you alone. Some of us who have lived a little bit of time can attest to the fact that the allurements of this world have turned out to be false, hollow, and unfulfilling. For the young today, we pray that you'd open up their eyes to that truth. The things that are knocking on the door of their soul, open them and give them wisdom to discern that it's as a rock that is striking the glass of a lighthouse. And systematically around their lives, there's the effort of this culture to take aim, one panel at a time, to remove their ability to shine. It's true for all of us. Heavenly Father, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus, you would shine through us. Lord, that we would leave this place today, letting our light so shine that when people see our good deeds, our good works, they'll glorify our Father, which is in heaven. We ask now for the baptism power of your Holy Spirit to come upon us. Jesus, fill us afresh. It's not how high we jump, how excited we get that matters, but it's how serious and how straight we walk this walk for Jesus. So Lord God, may we go from this place matches at least, torches at best, definitely seen. For you will never extinguish what you've begun in our lives. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, 